a time to hear and think about God's word. Before we hear God's word, let us pray. Thank you, Father, for revealing yourself to us in the Bible. And thank you for inviting us to come into your kingdom by entrusting our life to Jesus Christ. As you speak to us this morning, we ask that you will help us to listen with eager ears and to obey with joyful heart. We pray this for your glory and for our good. Amen. The Bible reading today is from Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Now the snake was sneakier than all the animals the Lord God had made. The snake came to the woman and asked her, Did God tell you not to eat from the tree in the garden? The woman said to the snake, We can eat fruit from any tree in the garden except the tree in the middle of the garden. God told us not to eat from it or even touch it. If we do, we will die. The snake said to the woman, no, you will not die. God knows that when you eat fruit from that tree, your eyes would be open and you would be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw how beautiful the tree was and how good its fruits would be to eat. And she wanted to, she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig tree leaves together and made clothes for themselves. Later, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the evening, and they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees. So the Lord God called out to the man and said, Where are you? The man replied, I heard you walking in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. Then the Lord God said, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? The man replied, the woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate it. So the Lord God asked the woman, what is this have you done? And the woman said, the snake tricked me, and I ate it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, as you may remember last week, I said that this week and next week, you should leave church fairly depressed. Uh, and uh, that will be so because we're looking at quite serious things. Uh, and today we're looking, as you can see on the screen, Paradise Lost. And we're looking at how it was lost and what this means for us today. Um, so let's begin by preparing ourselves by praying. Father, we thank you that you are good, that in you there is no evil, no darkness, only light and what is good. And we thank you that in the very beginning you made things good, very good, just the way you wanted them to be. And Lord, we now know that this world is not the same as it was then. Something has happened. And so we ask, Lord, that you will give us uh, ears that listen and hearts that are open to understand what it is that is wrong, not just with the world, but with us. And uh, we ask for this supernatural help because we resist it and we want what we want and so we ask that you will help us today 
And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, in 1967, this man is very famous, Mr. Louis Armstrong. He released a song called It's a Wonderful World. Very famous song, very popular even today. And I wanted to begin today by singing it to you. Well, actually, no, not singing it. I don't have that voice that he has. I thought I'd just read some of the words of this song to you and show you some pictures at the same time. Thank you, George. The song goes like this. I see skies of blue, clouds of white, bright, blessed days, dark, sacred nights. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colours of a rainbow, so pretty in the sky. They are also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands saying, how do you do? They're all saying, I love you. I see trees of green, red roses too. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Now, friends, the words to this song are truly wonderful. They are really wonderful. I mean, trees that are green, roses that are red, you know, friends bumping to, into each other on the street and touching elbows and saying, G'day, mate, how you going? I mean, these words are wonderful. But the truth is that the world we live in today, well, it's more like the pictures that you can see. Not so wonderful. That's the world that we live in today. There's suffering and anger and pain and hunger and murder and hatred and jealousy. There's the pandemic. There's wars. And at the end of it all, we will all die. You see, friends, the whole truth is that the world that we live in is a mixture. It's a mixture of good the good that God made in the very beginning. But it's a mixture of good and evil, of right and wrong, of sadness and great joy. But friends, why is it a mixture? I mean, in the beginning, God didn't make it a mixture. He made everything good. He made everything just the way he wanted it to be. So why is there evil? Why is there death, sickness? Why is there a mixture of these things in the world? You see, in the beginning, God made the world good, very good. There was man and woman, God, and the first humans had everything they needed. They had God. They had each other. They had, you know, the, tr the fruit from the trees of thousands of trees to choose from. Their world was good, very good, nothing bad. But today, this world is not so wonderful, is it? And really, if you think about it, if you're really honest with yourself, Australia is probably the closest thing we will have to living in the Garden of Eden. I mean, living here in Australia is probably the closest we will ever get to that experience, the experience they had. Now, we have peace. We, most of us have a place to live. And we certainly have a lot, enough food to eat, don't we? I mean, Australia is a wonderful place. And yet, even though it is so wonderful, we will still get sick here. And one day, we too will die here. So, friends, why? I mean, what went wrong with this perfect world that was made in the beginning? Why do we live outside of the garden today? What went wrong? Well, that is what we're going to look at today from Genesis chapter 3. Look at verse 1. Thank you, George. This is how the world was turned upside down. Now, the snake was sneakier than all the other animals that the Lord God had made. This snake came, came to the woman and asked, Did God tell you not to eat from any tree in the garden? Now, friends, a snake appears in the garden. Now, today we're afraid of snakes. But back then, there was nothing unusual about a snake in the garden that was in a world that was perfect. This was perfectly normal. 
But the truth is, this snake is no ordinary snake, is it? Because this snake is Satan, the devil. And later the Bible teaches us who Satan is. Satan was, you know, God's number one angel, God's number one servant who turned against God and became God's number one enemy. And this devil hates God. This Satan hates the world that God has made and this Satan hates God's people. And so this snake, this Satan, has come into the world to destroy the wonderful world that God has made. And this snake is sneaky. He's smart. And he has a simple two-step plan to destroy God's perfect world. And the first step, thank you, George, is this. The first step in Satan's plan is to make people doubt that God is good. Now, friends, in the beginning, Adam and Eve had everything they want. They were in a garden that was more like a rainforest. You know, it was full of life. They had thousands of trees to eat from. They had everything they wanted. But Satan comes into that world, goes to the woman, and says something like this, Hmm, Eve, nice garden, nice. Are you allowed to eat from every tree in this garden? Isn't there one tree that you're not allowed to eat from? The woman says, oh, yes, there's one tree. It's in the middle. God says we can't eat from that tree, and if we do, we will die. Well, friends, can you see what this woman is now thinking of? What is she thinking of? She has thousands of trees to choose from. But what is she suddenly thinking of? For the first time. Well, she's only thinking about one thing. She's not thinking about all those thousands of fruit trees that are all around her. She is now thinking about one thing and one thing only. That one tree in the middle of the garden. And suddenly, the woman, for the first time, she is beginning to doubt God's goodness. I wonder why God won't let me eat from that tree. I mean, it looks so good. I like it. I want it. And so, friends, now the woman is ready for step two in Satan's plan. Thank you, George. And this is his second step, the lie. Look at verse four. Thank you, George. Then the snake said to the woman, no, you will not die. God knows that when you eat from the fruit from that tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, friends, most people, when they read these words, have one big question in their minds. Everyone, almost everyone, has exactly the same question. And it's a very important question. Doesn't matter how old you are, you will probably have this one question when you read those words. And the question, thank you, George, goes something like this. Why is it wrong for Adam and Eve to want to know the difference between right and wrong? I mean, that is a question I've heard little kids at school say. Mr Omar, why is it wrong for Adam and Eve to want to know the difference between right and wrong? You know, this is a question that we all ask. This is the natural question when we read these words. And why is it natural? Well, it's natural because we spend most of our time trying to teach young people in particular what is right and wrong. I mean, if you're a parent, that's what you do over and over again, trying to teach your children the difference between right and wrong. You know, little Johnny, don't do that, no. Sweetie, you've got to share. Don't hit him. We're always teaching our children what is right and what is wrong. 
So friends, why does God say that it's wrong for Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Why is it bad for them? Well, you may be very surprised to find out that Adam and Eve actually already knew the difference between right and wrong before they ate the fruit. Now, I'll say that again because most people will miss that. I think that Adam and Eve already knew the difference between what was right and wrong before they ate the fruit. Now, let me show you. Thank you, George. Let me show you why I think this. This is from Genesis chapter 2. Listen to what God says to Adam. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God told him, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat any fruit from that tree, you will die before the day is over. You see, friends, back in chapter 2, in this perfect world, God told the man what was right and what was wrong. He told him. He said, you can eat from the trees in the garden. Tick, that's right. But you cannot eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. That's wrong. Don't do it. If you do, you will die. You see, the truth is these two people, the first people, are not ignorant. They know. They know because God told them. You can eat fruit from the trees, tick, but not from that tree. Wrong. Don't do it. And friends, if you think about it, the amazing thing is that in this perfect garden, there was only one thing that was wrong. Only one. You know, Adam and Eve didn't need 12 rules for life. There was only one rule for life in the perfect garden. So, friends, why were they not allowed to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? What's the problem? Why can't they eat from it? Why is it not good for them? We'll look again carefully at what Satan says, thank you, George, to the woman. Listen to what he is offering them. Then the snake said to the woman, no, you will not die. God knows that when you eat fruit from the tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You see, friends, the real problem is here that if the humans eat fruit from that tree, then they will know good and evil like God does. And knowing good and evil like God does doesn't mean just knowing it in your head. It doesn't mean just knowing what good is and what evil is. They already know that. God told them that in Genesis 2. You could eat fruit from the trees. That's good. You can't eat fruit from that tree. That's bad. That's not what this means. There is something else. There is a bigger problem that God is talking about here. So, friends, let me ask you, how does God know good and evil? How does he know? Well, the simple answer is, he decides. That's how he knows. That's how God knows good and evil. He decides what is good and evil. And he can do that because he made everything. He knows everything. He knows how everything works best. So he can decide what is good and what is evil. And that's Good. You see, the real problem here, the problem that will change the whole world if she makes the wrong decision, the real problem is that the woman and the man 
want to decide for themselves what is right and what is wrong for them without God. That, you do that, and you turn the world upside down. You see, the woman and the man, they just want to make their own rules. They want to be independent from God. They want to do what they want to do when they want to do it. They want to decide for themselves what is evil and what is good by themselves without God. That is what Satan is offering to them. That's what he's offering to them. Friends, this situation will change the world because Satan is offering them a new way of living, a new way of thinking without God in your life. He is offering them an existence where you can be your own God, where you can decide without God what is good for you, what is bad for you. So, friends, will the woman trust God who loves her and made her? Or will the woman and the man, will they trust Satan who hates God, hates God's world and hates them? Well, we know know the answer, don't we? Thank you, George. This is what happened. The woman saw how beautiful the tree was and how good its fruit would be to eat. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband and he ate it. You see, the first man and woman together decide to live a life without God. Together they decide to disobey God. Together they decide for the very first time to do what they want to do when they want to do it. For the very first time they experience a new way of living without God. And friends, from that one moment in history, the whole world has been turned upside down. Because these first humans rejected the most important truth in this universe. And the most important truth that these first two humans rejected was that God is God and we are not. And when we do that, everything changes. No good will come from that. When you decide that, when you live like that, everything will go wrong. Even the good that God gives will be turned around and mixed and destroyed. And friends, when they rejected this truth by disobeying God, the truth was their eyes were opened. They were opened to a a new way of living. Their eyes were open to a new way to live your life, a new way to think, a way where God is not there anymore. And that's why our world has changed. Now, friends, many people today think that's a good thing. You know, most people around us think, hey, I don't need God. Who's he to tell me what to do? I should be able to do whatever I want, whenever I want. I'm a free person. And that's what they call it. They call it freedom and they celebrate this new way of living without God. But friends, this morning I want us to look very closely and honestly at this new way of thinking. I want you to honestly look at what happens to you when you live as your own God. So let's begin. Thank you, George. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked, so they sewed uh, fig leaves together and they made clothes for themselves. Now, friends, suddenly being naked is a problem. It wasn't a problem before. 
before they were open and, and free and giving, sacrificial. But now their eyes have been opened to another world. Another world where they are vulnerable. Another world where someone else can hurt you and you can hurt them. And so, of course, you hide. You cover yourself. You protect yourself. Well, friends, welcome to a world of human wisdom without God. Welcome to a world where everyone you meet can hurt you and you can hurt them. That's the world we live in. That's why we hide. And really the consequences of entering this new life where you are God and God is not, the consequences are terrible. You know, every part of your life is affected. All your relationships are affected. Look at this. Thank you, George. Later, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. And they hid themselves from the Lord God. So the Lord God called out to the man and said, where are you? The man replied, oh, I heard you walking in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Now, friends, this has never happened before. The man and woman never hid from God. God was always their father. Whenever they saw God walking in the cool of the day, they ran up to God with a big smile on their face, their arms open wide. Daddy, let's go for a walk. But not now. No more. Because now, suddenly, their father has become their judge. And so they run and they hide and they blame Look at these words. Thank you, George. Then the Lord God said, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat uh, fruit from the tree that I told you not to eat from? The man replied, the woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate. So the Lord God asked the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the snake tricked me and I ate. Friends, welcome to life without God. Welcome to human wisdom without God. I mean, this is terrible. And did you notice just how smart human wisdom can be without God? You know, Adam, this is his first sentence. These are the first words he says in the Garden of Eden that we know of. You know, and what does he do with the first words that come out of his mouth? What does he do? He blames the woman and God at the same time. That's amazing, isn't it? God says, did you eat from the tree, you know, fruit from the tree that I told you not to? And the man says, oh, it wasn't my fault. It was the woman you gave me. Now, you've got to admit, that's pretty clever. I mean, that's, that's clever. That's smart, man. That's high-level intellectual thinking. But it's destructive. It destroys. It kills human life. Human wisdom without God kills. That's what happened. That's what happens today. Friends, when my three sons were very young, really young, actually I haven't asked you for permission for this, but bad luck. When my three sons were very young, one day I found Isaac in our backyard, covered in grass, crying. And so I've, you know, I went up to, the, to Isaac, I sort of tried to comfort him a little, Noah was there, son number two. Noah's not here today. Very suspicious, I think. <laughs> I said to Noah, Noah, what, what happened to Isaac? Noah looks at me and says, Caleb did it. <laughs> so, of course, I went looking for Caleb. 
We've got a big house. It took a long time. But I found Caleb. So I asked him, Caleb, did you? He dies. Caleb looked at me in my face. Can you guess what he said? No, I didn't. They were three, five, and seven years old. And already they were masters of finger pointing. Masters of blaming. Now, why? I mean, who taught them this? I mean, I didn't teach them this. Jem certainly didn't teach them this. We actually wanted to teach them the exact opposite. Be kind, be generous, help one another. Who taught them this? Well, the truth is, they were born like this. They're like that because they were born like that. And they were born like that because their father's like that. And I'm like that because our ancestors are like that. Adam and Eve, they're like that. We're like that. I'm like that. You're like that. You see, friends, deep down inside, thank you, George, we want to live like this picture. This is what is in the heart of every person. We want to do what we want to do when we want to do it. That's all of us. If you're honest, you will know. We want to be the God of our own life. We want to be independent of God. We want to decide for ourselves, without him, what is good and what is bad for me. And we do this because we don't trust God. We doubt his goodness. And friends, this attitude is what the Bible calls sin. Just like in our English lesson, sin is a noun first. It's an attitude first. It's an attitude that lives in your heart first. Then it's a verb. Then you do it. That is the problem with our world. Friends, the world is wonderful. It's a wonderful world. But it's a mixture. There is shame and guilt and suffering, broken relationships, disease, resentment, bitterness, hatred, and there is death. And that is why we need someone to save us. But the problem is we can't save ourselves because the problem is us. The problem is what's in here. The problem is our desire to be God. That's the problem. You can't fix that problem. And that's why we need someone to come from the outside. We need someone from the outside to come into our world, to come into our lives and to fix this problem that we have, this problem of sin, this problem of desiring to be God, to decide for ourselves without him. And that is why we need Jesus. (laughs) He's the only one. He saves us from the penalty of sin and he saves us from the power of of sin. Only a life lived with him can do it. Nothing else will work. Only he can convince us that God is good. Only he can show us that God is good so much that we finally let go and we finally let God be God again. Friends, may this be true for us today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this story. 
that shows us so much about what we are like. We look at our ancestors and we see in their eyes, we see a reflection of us and how we want the same things. Father, we ask that you will really work in our lives to show us just how good you are so that we may be freed from this desire to rule for ourselves without you. Please, Father, show us, teach us again and again as a, a parent teaches little children, teach us how good you are so that we may let you be our Father again. And we ask this in the name of your one and only Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, friends, there is one question, or, uh, sorry, two-part question. Uh, the first thing is, what things make us doubt that God is good? So think about all the different things that make us doubt that God is good. On the other side, what things show us that God is good? Where do we look to see that God is good? Because I think that's the key. That's the secret. Okay, you have five minutes with the people around you. Enjoy your conversations and then we'll come back together. All right, let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we listen to Omar today, there is this challenge that we face to see ourselves as members of the human race, children of Adam and Eve, who want to be able to decide for ourselves what we want to do and when, to acknowledge that we want to go our own way, to be God of our own life, to do what seems to good to us in our own way of thinking, all too often ignoring the things we could and should do to others in our interactions with those around us. Thank you for sending Jesus to help us know deep down that he's there for us, whatever happens, and help us to accept this love and live as you want. At this time, we pray for your overruling with this new coronavirus affecting this, your world. Thank you for lessening the restrictions in our daily lives. We thank you for guiding those who are developing vaccines and for their effect effectiveness that they might be good controls. Give wisdom to those in authority, prime minister, state premiers, the medicos, as they make or relax laws. We pray for health workers, nurses, doctors, hospital staff, for their health and for their ability to cope if the workload becomes more intense with this easing of lockdown. We thank you for our leaders here, Omar and Jem with the English family, as well as for Simon and the Chinese congregation. We pray for our church family, for each of us as the day unfolds with various challenges. Help us make wise decisions for our individual contacts during everyday life, that each of us will continue to learn about you, to introduce Jesus into conversations, that any who don't yet trust in Jesus may want to know more and commit their life to follow him. We pray for any who are not well and ask for healing and strength to cope with each day. We pray for Anita's mother, soon to move back to her own home by herself, for Tien's mother and father needing support and care overseas, for Daisy's father in China and for uh, David's brother, uh, brother's, David's sister, Pat, that her treatment will be effective. For any others that we don't specifically know, we ask your help, guidance and encouragement day by day. We pray for those who've been part of St John's family and are now reaching out to tell others of your love and salvation. We pray for their everyday lives as they cope with language, being away from loved ones, and in difficult climates, as they too face restrictions with this worldwide 
epidemic. We pray for Malcolm and Leanne's work in Asia. We pray for their students, especially those in the final year as they struggle with online learning. And we pray for Malcolm and Leanne's time in Oz for their son's wedding. I haven't heard quite yet that they've arrived in Australia, but they were supposed to come last weekend. And we pray for their easy re-enter into their work in Vietnam in a few weeks' time. Mikey, we pray for Mikey and Lil and, and their children as they're all studying, so it must be very hard to be concentrating. Pray for Craig and Belinda who are in Australia now looking for opportunities to contact those who've been praying for them while they were overseas. And we pray especially for their son Ezra as he's finished secondary school and decides on plans for adult life. We pray for Peter and Catherine and Layla and Brannock in West Africa as they work in the office of SIM. And Peter is putting finishing touches to an exhibition of paintings depicting Jesus coming and suffering. Then we pray for Grant and Laura in Greenacre, Erwin and Catherine at Wollongong. Most of all, thank you, Father, for your love in sending Jesus, for your love and care for each one of us each day. And we pray all this in his name. Amen. <laughs>